I'm Corey. And I'm Eric. We're your new hosts for Cosmic Adventures. Let's jump right into your topic for today, stupid names in astronomy. A brief disclaimer. Astronomy is an old science, and while physicists and chemists get to perform experiments with their own hands, astronomers are often left staring at objects light years away, with no way to interact with the objects they study. So it's no wonder that when they try to name something new, they may not pick the most accurate descriptors. Still, there are a few naming conventions in astronomy misleading enough to frustrate many a new astronomy student. Here are a few of the most notorious. Edwin Hubble famously developed a tuning fork diagram for sorting galaxies. Unfortunately, he called the large ellipticals early and the spirals late-type galaxies. Now, Hubble himself warned that he had no idea of how galaxies evolved, and it was simply a naming convention with no intended meaning. But since we're now pretty sure that late-type spirals merge to produce early-type ellipticals, the backwards names kind of suck. Compounding the problem, astronomers often refer to the biggest, hottest stars as early type and small, cool stars as late type. This is from a time when astronomers thought stars actually evolved from hot stars to cool stars. But in fact, large stars have very different lives than small stars, and they take very separate, distinct evolutionary paths. Not to mention, many late type stars are among the oldest in the universe. Then there's one of the stranger quirks of astronomy, which is that we define any element not hydrogen or helium as a metal. Oxygen, nitrogen, Carbon? All metals. To my high school chemistry teacher, Miss Montoya, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Lastly, planetary nebulae. Spoiler for those of you who have been living under a rock and never seen a picture of one. They have nothing to do with planets. In astronomy, one group, the International Astronomical Union, determines official names. You probably know them already from the infamous vote nearly a decade ago to evict Pluto from its position as a planet. That move was set off by the discovery of Eris an object thought to be larger than Pluto and way far out in the Kuiper Belt. We now know the two worlds are twins. But with Pluto dethroned, it also started a debate about the definition of a planet. The IAU came up with several criteria to determine if an object was a planet. It must orbit the sun, be mostly round, and have swept its neighborhood of debris. Of course, that definition should throw us out too, because Earth also wouldn't be a planet at Pluto's distance. It wouldn't be a planet where it is now really either. Debris hits us regularly, as anyone who's ever watched a meteor shower knows. And if you want to be a stickler about things, no exoplanet can even fit the definition because they don't orbit the sun. Well, it seems a little self-centered. Now, many of their rules have been around for a while, helping keep naming conventions nice and tidy. Jupiter's moons are named after daughters of Zeus, the planet's Roman name. Neptunes are named for water gods. And most, but not all, of Uranus's moons take their titles from Shakespeare. Now, those rigid conventions can sometimes clash with culture. When astronomers found new moons around Pluto a few years ago, they launched a naming contest. Right. And voters settled on Vulcan, with some PR help from the likes of William Shatner. But then the IAU nixed the name and went with Styx and Kerberos instead. It could have been worse. I poked around the box of proposed names at Lowell Observatory after school kids came through on a field trip and spotted some real gems. The god of the underworld could have been orbited by the moon's fart and boogers. <laughs> All right. And when it comes to naming man-made objects, it's even worse. It started out innocent enough. We had the Very Large Array, the VLA, and the Very Large Telescope, the VLT, and of course the Large Binocular Telescope, LBT. But recently, Large and Very Large aren't good enough. The Americans had to build the 30-meter telescope, and the Europeans want their extremely large telescope. Sadly, the world's bank account wasn't big enough for OWL, the overwhelmingly large telescope, which would have been 100 meters across. And if astronomers are uncreative in their telescope names, they seem driven to find the weirdest acronyms for their projects as possible. Some of them are simply nerdy. The SARON, Spectrographic Aerial Unit for Research on Optical Nebulae project, uses Gandalf, Gas and Absorption Line Fitting Algorithm, for its data reduction. APES, the Astronomical Imaging Processing System, was used to reduce data from the Very Large Array for decades. The name itself isn't so bad, but the instruction manual included pictures of monkeys and banana recipes at the end of most chapters. Just, what? Some of them are trying way too hard. We found Gadzooks, gadolinium antineutrino detectors zealously outperforming old Cameo Conde, super. Messenger, the Mercury Surface Space Environment Geochemistry and Ranging. And Lucifer, LBT near-infrared spectroscopic utility with camera and integral field unit for extragalactic research. Then there are ones where you wonder who let that get out of committee. Like sex tractor or source extractor. There's Poopsie, the phase one observing proposal system. Run DMC, radial velocity using n-body differential evolution Markov chain Monte Carlo. Fatboy, the Florida analysis tool 
born of yearning for high-quality scientific data. Pint of Ale, packaged for the interactive analysis of wine emission. And of course, WISEAS, the Wiseman Institute of Science Experimental Astrophysics Spectroscopy System. Did we miss any of your favorite stupid names? Let us know by email or in the comments below. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.